Welcome to Spotlight Sessions, where we shine What's a light your story? on incredible What does accessibility mean to you? What's your mission? where we shine a light on incredible individuals and organizations and the work that they do. I'm your host, Josh Basil. I'm a C45 quadriplegic, paralyzed below my shoulders, and a power wheelchair user. I'm the community relations manager at Accessibility and a passionate disability rights advocate and trial attorney focused on breaking down barriers to access and inclusion for people with disabilities. Today on Accessibility Spotlight Sessions, we're joined by Karen Foster, the executive director of All Out Adventures. Welcome, Karen. Well, Thank I'm excited nice to, to share here. your story and the great work that you're doing. So let's dive right in. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Sure. Yeah, I'm the executive director of All Out Adventures. We're a, a small nonprofit based in Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, I've been lucky enough to be with the organization since 2004. Um, and it's kind of all I've ever wanted to do. Um, so. Um, my work and my home life can look pretty similar. I can be found out cycling and paddling and cross-country skiing and um, enjoying the great outdoors of Western Massachusetts. Um, How did you make your way in 2004 for the, to the foundation? I, I think I got pretty lucky. Um, I had actually been a high school teacher. Um, I had been a history teacher and, um, you know, had really fallen in love with cycling and kayaking and um as much as I liked working with the students, teaching really wasn't for me and had been thinking about what my next steps might be. And All Out Adventures was hiring for a program coordinator, uh, which I applied for and I didn't get that job, um, but they did hire me as a part-time program leader. Um, so I started running programs as a program leader in 2004. And then um, in 2007, uh, when the executive director who was one of the founders moved on, um, I was lucky enough to be in You got your foot in the door and started, showed your skills and talents and they moved you on up. I love that. And um, so tell us a little bit more about kind of all out adventures and, and the different and the work that you're doing in the community. Yeah, we um, we were really founded as um, a support to the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, which does just incredible accessibility work throughout Massachusetts with accessible infrastructure and the four founders of all out adventures. Um, in the late 90s um, saw the need for programming, um, you know, to that recognition that you can have all the accessible infrastructure in the world, um, but to really support people who have disabilities and accessing the state parks, there was a need for accessible recreation programming. Um, and so, um, you know, two, two people who are accessibility advocates, um, one of them worked for the um, Department of Conservation and Recreation and, and actually still does, um, and the other um, advocate is still a member of our board of directors. And then two um, people who were trained in outdoor recreation. We have an amazing community college, Greenfield Community College near here that does, um, you know, a really wonderful one year outdoor leadership um, certificate program. And the four of them put their heads together and started All Out Adventures back in 2001. And since then, we've grown quite a bit. We were really originally, you know, very focused just on supporting the state parks. Um, but since then we've expanded, um, we have another contract to serve um, specifically individuals who have brain injuries. Um, we have a federal grant to serve veterans. And then we also sell and service recumbent trikes um, and have a, a series of programs for seniors. So we've sort of expanded our programming season and our opportunities and our mission. Um, I love over expanding the years means been. reaching more numbers, helping more families, making more touches. Um, that, that's a beautiful thing. Exactly. Um, so. As of now, since 2004, I know your day to day looks a lot different than it did back then. So what, what are you doing day to day these days? Oh, wow. It's, um, it's so wild. What an interesting question. Like there are, there are days I try to spend one or two days a week, um, that I work at home and I just focused on grant writing, grant reporting, all of the like emails and the, you know, spreading the word kind of really heavy focus work. Um, and then I try to get to one to two programs a week. Yesterday I was out um, cycling with um, a high school special education class at our local high school. Um, we were riding bikes around the track. Um, I try to get often to our kayaking and stand up paddleboarding programs. 
Um, and sometimes I'm, I'm in as another program leader, as a staff member. Sometimes I'm just there as an extra set of hands. Um, you know, if we have somebody coming that's maybe a first timer or somebody who I think may need support, um, I try to go to programs at those times as well. But my days are wildly different. It's a lot, a lot of people don't recognize, job. especially with nonprofits, like a lot of the, a lot of the efforts are, are done on development and grant writing or getting donations in because these programs cost a lot of money and it's, it's to put it on and to help the community. It's, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta fund it. Um, so with, with kind of all of that, uh, can you tell us more about your website where people can go to make donations and things of that nature? Yeah. And, um, one of our, well, I'll start there. Our website is alloutadventures.org. Um, and that's one of the things that we work to help people recognize is adaptive recreation. It, it does cost money. Um, you know, we have, we, you know, we have low staff to participant ratios. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time moving gear, setting gear up and ensuring we have enough people who are highly trained and skilled. And we always look at our programs as would I send my own family member to this program and feel that the quality of service they were going to receive, that they would be respected and safe and cared for. Um, that's our gold standard. And in order to do that, it does take resources. Um, so yes, our website's alloutadventures.org. We just hosted our big annual fundraiser, the Kayakathon, um, but we're cooking something up for April as well. Um, and of course we accept donations. And with, uh, with the, the families that go through the programs, the, is there any cost involved for them? Um, no, I, well, there is, it's a minimal cost, but we always subsidize for anybody who needs it. Um, our programs typically cost from five to eight dollars um, for people who have disabilities to come. And it's just that recognition, right, that um, living with a disability can be very, very expensive. And um, we don't want people to choose between taking a bike ride or you know, getting the bus ride they need or getting groceries. So as we look at what barriers we can break down for recreation, cost is one of them. Um, so we do request a participant fee. It makes a, a difference in our budget, um, but we have participants that, that $5 is too much and, and we cover I, no questions. With asked. my nonprofit, I do a lot of uh, adventures as well. Uh, I, my, our program's called Living with Adventurous Wheels. But I, I found sometimes even doing kind of those $5, $8, it kind of, creates a, from an attendance standpoint, more people show up because they, they're almost investing in the adventure, but obviously making it as, as cost, uh, reducing costs definitely takes a burden off of these families. Like you said, it's having, having a disability can be quite costly. And um, the focus of this is, is really to have memories and, and to, to get out there and to test test the limits and, and that kind of that segues into my next question I would love to ask you. And it's like, why do you think it's so important for people with disabilities to, to have access to adaptive recreation and adventures? Oh my gosh. You know, over the years, I've, I've been lucky enough to do this work for long enough to have many different answers to that question. Um, but I think fundamentally what I've really grown to see I have two kids, they're seven and 11. Um, and what we do as a family and how we spend our time connecting and interacting with each other is a bike ride to school or a bike ride to get ice cream or a canoe camping trip. Like those are the, those are the moments when I feel most a part of the world and the most connected to my family. And so, you know, when I think about or have, you know, over the years gotten to know families where that's not as easy as grabbing your bikes from the shed and taking a ride, being able to provide these programs, it's just, it's meaningful almost beyond description. When I see, say, a couple go kayaking together, um, which is something maybe they used to do until one of them had an injury or, or you know, another disability, and they like relive this connecting part of themselves um, it's, it's just really, really powerful. And, and then I think beyond the individual impacts, it's just that idea that people who have disabilities belong in the world. And so, you know, people who have disabilities belong kayaking on the lakes and on the bike path and on the hiking trails and camping in our state park cabins. 
um, these, this is just the infrastructure that we as a culture and a society feel is important um, to provide for, for people um, in the state. And that should be available. Yeah, those everybody. experiences, the, you know, a, after my injury, I had to hit a reset button. I went from a college athlete to a quadriplegic paralyzed below the shoulders. And they, they really were two different worlds, yeah. but really in the same world, like it's, the, the world is still filled with so much beauty. It's just the difference is how are you going to experience it? And before my injury, I did things 1 million ways. And now after my injury, I get to do it 1 million new ways, 1 million different ways. And those new and different ways can still be incredibly beautiful and meaningful and full of love, laughter and adventure and possibilities. Um, it's just so much. I, I know with your participants, it's just like getting them to have a willingness to try and sometimes get a little outside their comfort zone, but like it then creates like the next challenge, the next obstacle that much easier to overcome. And it's, I love what you're doing. Adventure, adventure programs, nonprofits that do these across the country and especially yours, it's just, you're, you're changing lives. There's no doubt about it. And you're also turning a lot of heads probably at the same time. A lot of people, like, what's going on over there? And like, oh, I didn't know that that, could, that was possible or that happened. And then next thing you know, they have a conversation with a loved one that has a disability. It says, you gotta do this. This is pretty cool. Yeah. So. Thank, thank you for what you do. Yeah. And with your programs, thank tell you. me more, what are some of your more popular recreation activities and adventures? Um, our cycling is definitely one of the most popular. And part of that is I think it's, you know, probably the most accessible program. We have everything from two wheel tandem bikes to hand cycles to recumbent trikes to a wheelchair tandem where we can actually transport um, a manual wheelchair so so an individual can stay in their custom chair. Um, so on a typical Friday afternoon um, on our really popular bike path, we might see 50 to 60 people um, over the course of the afternoon out biking, which is amazing. Um, and then our kayaking is the other one that is just, um, it, there's a sense of adventure to going kayaking. Very often we're conquering just a, a touch of fear to get out onto the water. And yet it's also incredibly accessible. Um, you know, we can, we can do an awful lot to make kayaking um, very comfortable. Um, so cycling and kayaking are two of the biggest. And then the other kind of a, a program people might not think about is we run a, a snowshoeing program in the winter for seniors. And that one is, is wildly popular. And we have so many people come who want to stay active and in a group, but don't feel comfortable going on their own. Uh, but those are those are probably the three the three biggest. So, all right, you mentioned before. Yeah. Tell me more about this kayakathon. This is this is intriguing. I want to know more. It is. I will say it's my favorite day of the year. Um, it's our annual fundraiser, and so we live right near the Connecticut River, um, which is a a big wide, maybe it's three quarters of a mile wide to a mile wide, um, slow moving river. And um, we have, we kayak 12 miles or five miles. So what we do is we start at a Northern town named Sunderland and um, people put in there. And then we kayak to the next town named Hatfield, which is about a seven mile paddle from Sunderland to Hatfield. And then in Hatfield is where most people join us. And so this past year, we launched 118 people in Hatfield and kayaked on down to Northampton where, um, you know, where we're based another five miles. And what I love the most about the kayakathon is that it's fully inclusive. So um, program participants who have disabilities, um, young children, seniors, as well as community members who just love to paddle and want to see it be accessible, uh, all participate. And we also, you know, we started this um, event 16 years ago when paddleboarding wasn't really a thing. So we're always thinking about like, what's our new name? Because um, right now it's kayakathon and paddleboards and canoes too. Uh, but we also had a number of people paddleboarding um, this year. And, um, you know, it's it's just a really big community building fun day out on the water that that brings you all the people together. creating a little small Navy fleet out on the water. <laughs> It felt like it. Yes, I um, I sort of warned other river users we'd be out there that day and got a lot of feedback that that we'd been spotted. Um, so we yeah we were that. we were a big flotilla. I love that. And how do how do people get more involved? Um, so tell me more how participants can sign up. Tell me more how 
uh, volunteers can sign up? Yeah, so we, um, we have a program calendar. Um, right now, for the most part, we run programs that um, we have a funder for. So that's, you know, our different contracts, our veterans grant. Um, so each season we get together and we put our program calendar out online. Um, and so people can look at our program calendar, see when they're able to make it. And then they just give us a call or send us an email. And at each program, um, you know, we're, we're really used to and comfortable integrating people who have never participated before. And that can actually be really fun. Um, so we might have people who've been coming kayaking with us for 10, 12 years, as well as a first timer in the same group. So there's a lot of learning from each other. Um, so people, they definitely give us a call or email to sign up ahead of time um, so that we're prepared. We know we have enough equipment. We know we have enough st staff available. Um, and then volunteers, similarly, um, you know, people who have an interest in supporting our work can either volunteer in the office, um, helping with like filing our waivers and our email list and all the behind the scenes stuff or out at programs um, with helping participants to sign in. Um, sometimes providing one-to-one -one support can be a really important volunteer job. So, you know, tandem paddling in a kayak, which frees our staff up to, to be with the whole group. Um, and volunteers can call us or email us. Um, there's a contact form on our website with their interest in to learn more. And we can kind of help plug them into programs where we need to in the hands. right direction. I love that. And so what, since 2004, yeah. what's, a, what's an achievement that you've been most proud of? You know, it's so it's all it's all the little moments um, that 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 add up. But I think where we really get our pride or where we really feel like we're our work is so meaningful is when people refer us to somebody else. So very often someone will come to a program and it almost feels like they're the scout of their friend group. Um, and then the next week they come back with others or um you know, just over the weekend, we um, sometimes work with the Veterans Administration to sell recumbent trikes to veterans who are transitioning from a two-wheel bike or due to their disability need a recumbent trike. We had a veteran come down from Maine, and she said that it was the VA up in Maine said, oh, you have to work with All Out Adventures, like we wouldn't send you anywhere else. And when we get that kind of, of feedback from people who either had such a good experience themselves that they say, oh, my loved one should come back and, and get to be a part of this or that outside, you know, validation from the, the VA. I mean, the people driving four five, six hours to come see us to buy a trike, but they know that when they come to us, we're going to be used to um, working with people who have mobility concerns, who are going to need an extra hand and, and they'll be treated respectfully and they'll be able to get what they need. So to this is, it's a perfect transition to my next question of, well, what's like a business message you would give to business owners of why it's important to cater to the disability community? And before you answer that, I'm going to just kind of like paraphrase what you just said or what I just heard from you. It's just the disability community is like a brand loyal community when they're treated right. Like you, you guys treat the community, right? You guys get natural referrals. You get people coming back the next week. You've having them bring their friends, their natural advocates, and they want to share with the world, what works and what works really well. Um, but I know this, this question can be answered many different ways, but like, I feel like you just answered it in what you were saying with what you're most proud of, but here, sorry, I want you to talk more, Karen. <laughs> no, that was really helpful to hear. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that that piece is, is part of it. I mean, it's also just the right thing to do, but beyond that, when I think about the people I know who have disabilities, it's an awful lot of work to go into planning, say, an outing to go out to dinner or, you know, to go shopping. Um, you know, especially we live in an old New England town where not everything is accessible. So people are forever needing to call ahead to learn how many steps from the accessible parking is it to your restaurant or are there steps indoors or how much space is there between the tables and what kind of chairs do you have? Like all of those questions. And when somebody finds the business that works for them, you know, the place they can go out to eat and they can access it and they can use the restroom and there aren't any barriers, they're going to keep going back because now they know like they're not going to be in a situation where maybe they've gone out with their friends and family and they can't even get through the door of the place they were expecting to go. Um, so that's, that's just a really 
huge point, which I guess gets to your point too about the loyalty is when you have a good, comfortable, accessible, respectful experience. I mean, it's human nature. That's where you're going to keep going. And lastly, I wanted to ask you, if you could have a conversation with anybody in the world, who would it be and why? Gosh, um, that is like, that is such a big picture question to even think about how to answer it. (laughs) Um, You know, I think the early leaders in the disability rights movement, and I wouldn't even want to pick out an, uh, an individual because sometimes the people who are making headlines, that's really important. But like, who else was part of going to the Capitol or who else was, was part of, you know, that early brave work? It, it was so many people. And I'm so interested in those stories of like, how did you get involved? How did you decide to, it's risky and, you know, to, to take those risks, the social risks and the physical risks to be a part of it. Um, so maybe rather than like meeting with one individual, I would love to go back and be a fly on the wall, um, you know, to the energy leading up to some of that work and to really understand kind of how this, these disparate people came the, together. The disability to rights movement, impact. definitely. It took, it took an army. It took, it took a lot of wheels on the ground, a lot of voices, a lot of disabilities, a lot of abilities to make it happen. And the fight continues. So, um, Karen, thank you so much for being our guest today. You did an incredible job and I loved, loved your insights, your experiences and all the work that you're doing. So thank you, Karen. And to our guests, thank you so much for staying to the end until next time. Um, have a great day. Thank you.